Hello. Uh, good afternoon po sa inyong lahat. Uh, welcome to the webinar entitled Looking Beyond Curriculum Planning for the LAS Profession with Dr. Maureen Henninger. This event is brought to you by the University of the Philippine School of Library and Information Studies, the Council of Deans and Heads of LAS Schools, and the Philippine Association of Teachers of Library and Information Science Incorporated. We received over 300 registrations from LAS educators, librarians, archivists, and other information professionals, both here in the Philippines and abroad. So thank you and welcome to all of you. I am Paul Jason Perez, a faculty member of UPSLIS, your host and moderator for this webinar. Ayun, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's wait for a few minutes for the others to join. Uh, as I mentioned, there's over 300 of you who registered. So let's hope uh, a good portion will be able to join us for this uh, very special uh, topic and discussion that we're going to have this afternoon. Okay, so now that most of you are here, uh, the format of our webinar is that there is there will be a lecture which will be followed by a Q&A session later. All questions must be submitted through slido.com using the code curriculum. And before we begin, we have some questions for you first using slido.com. And para po nakapag-practice kayo, no? paano ba? gamitin ito para mas maging interactive yung ating discussion this afternoon. So please allow me to share my screen here. Okay, so again, welcome everyone for our webinar this afternoon entitled Looking Beyond Curriculum Planning for LS Professor with Dr. Henniger. And I am inviting everyone to go to slido.com and then Type in the code hashtag, uh, type in the code curriculum. It can be uppercase or lowercase, or you can also scan the QR code that you're seeing on your screen. So again, that's slido.com and use curriculum. So just to try this out, uh, unang question, ano po bang ulam nyo kanina? Nakapag-lunch na po ba kayong lahat? So, uh, Maureen, I'm asking our participants, what's their food this uh, this uh, afternoon? Because uh, as some of you may have known, uh, Maureen is currently here in the Philippines as a visiting professor, and she's quite enjoying the Filipino food, right, Maureen? <laughs> Absolutely. I haven't eaten so much in all my life. I don't think it's so good. <laughs> well, uh, just to share, some of our participants had sisig, lumpiang Shanghai, fried tilapia, milkfish, lechon, mongo. Some of those Maureen had already tried, but thank you. I uh, will try the rest. Okay, so this is how Slido works. No? Uh, and then later on, you can also submit your questions so that our speaker will be able to address them. Now, moving on to some serious questions, uh, because our topic for this afternoon is about the LAS curriculum. Our first question will be, what are your challenges in implementing or using the current BLIS curriculum? So what are your challenges in implementing or using the current BLIS curriculum? So let's think of this, let's think about this for couple of minutes, take your time, and please share it with us. What have been your challenges in using the latest one from the CHED uh, memo released in 2015? Oh, interesting. 
RA9246 limitations. Uh -huh. The content of syllabus, specifically the course outline, has been challenging, it seems. Uh, also, if you're not in Slido, feel free to share your answers in the chat section so that I can read it as well. If you can't join us in Slido, if you want to put your responses in a chat section, uh, feel free to do so. So for those who are just joining in, we have now around 50 uh, participants. So uh, please join us. If you want to answer the question, go to slido.com and use the code curriculum. Uh, there's ICT subjects, Maureen. Uh, you can see that uh, other people are uh, commenting. Limited course outline, accreditation, and research in LIS. Instructors, computer skills, integration of IT subjects. Mm -hmm. Syllabus on ICT subjects and special topics. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for sharing those responses and throughout the talk, uh, we'll uh, please think about these questions and then we'll go back to these uh, after. Now, uh, the second question that we have in here, what are the things that you would like to see in the new DLIS curriculum? What are the, in the new DLIS curriculum? If ever, no, magkakaroon ng bagong DLIS curriculum. And if you feel that there's a need to have a new DLIS curriculum, what are the things that you need that you would like to see it to be included or to be removed in the new DLIS curriculum? Oh, wow, uh, more research courses. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, community integration, for example, syllabi, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Research-oriented curriculum. Uh, Mr. Aquil uh, Sir Aquilino, ICT subjects and LIS faculty uh, with limited IT skills and knowledge, probably yung challenge, no, kanina. Thank you for sharing that, sir. Uh, outreach program integration, so more uh, relevant no, to the community. Very interesting. Community immersion and research. So I hope uh, the participants are seeing the responses from your fellow participants. Uh, we'll go back to these again later after the talk and during the Q&A. So that's how uh, we use Slido. So again, uh, throughout the talk, you can submit your questions by going to slido.com and then using our code uh, curriculum. Okay. So to formally begin, in our webinar for today, uh, may I please call on the Dean of the University of the Philippines School of Library and Information Studies, Professor 
Mary Grace Golfo Barcelona for her opening remarks. Uh, Dean Mary. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, EJ. First and foremost, allow me to thank each and everyone for joining us this afternoon for the webinar on curriculum planning for the LIS profession, Looking Beyond. Jointly organized by UP School of Library and Information Studies and Philippine Association of Teachers of LIS and um, Council of uh, Deans and Heads of Library and Information Studies, so Codlis. I would also like to thank our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Maureen Henninger, one of the foremost experts in information management, not only in Australia, but in the whole world, I must say. Dr. Henninger will talk about the current prospects for the LIS profession and its implications to curriculum planning. I'm sure a lot of you would agree that the LIS landscape has changed a lot over the past decades than when it was first offered. It has expanded and have included other areas of information studies, which are very relevant today. These changes are further hastened by the development of new technologies that aid LIS professionals in the handling and processing of information. LIS educators, like most of us here, have been trying to catch up with this expanding horizon of the LIS profession. We need to continue to plan and update our curricula to keep it relevant. Moreover, the past two years with the COVID-19 pandemic, it has further confirmed the importance and critical roles that LIS professionals play when it comes to the handling processing, and making available and accurate information for everyone. Likewise, there have been additional or basic foundational knowledge and skills that LIS students should acquire prior to working in a rapidly changing field brought, brought about by major developments in our environment. This afternoon, our guest speaker, who happens to be a visiting professor of our school, the UP SLIS, will give us a general discussion of how LIS educators can plan for the development of the LIS curriculum based on the perceived prospects for the LIS profession in the next years to come. So I will not keep you waiting. Again, thank you very much to everyone and welcome to the web webinar on curriculum planning for the LIS profession, Looking Beyond. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat po, Dean Mary Grace, for those uh, inspiring and uh, beautiful words. Uh, moving on, it is with great pride and honor for me to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Our speaker is Dr. Maureen Henninger. Dr. Henninger is in the forefront of research and practice in the digital environment, and with the advent of the internet, published and consulted widely on digital literacy for industry, government, and non-government organizations, both in Australia and internationally. She has been an invited guest speaker at many conferences uh, within the information, medical, biotechnology, and education professions. As an information professional, she has worked with government and international organizations to deliver digital literacy and projects for the preservation of information artifacts in many Asian and Pacific countries. In her academic career, her research, curriculum, and teaching has been in the field of digital literacy, and more recently, data literacy, particularly in the journalistic field. Her current concern is with governmental mechanisms and practices that enable and constrain democratic processes and active citizenship. Dr. Henninger finished a bachelor's degree from the University of Sydney, a graduate diploma in information management 
and a master's degree in information science from the University of New South Wales, and a doctor of philosophy degree from the University of Technology, Sydney, where she is currently a visiting fellow at the School of Communication specializing in digital information management. Also, she is currently a visiting professor at the UP School of Library and Information Studies. Personally, I know her as a former professor who exhibited passion and excellence in her field and compassion and generosity to her students. So everyone, uh, this afternoon, let us all welcome uh, Dr. Maureen Henninger. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am so honored to be asked to speak to you today because the honor is really mine because you are the professionals. So I want to talk a little bit more about my ideas that uh, are based on what you have named this that seminar, looking beyond. So what are we looking beyond? Beyond yesterday? Beyond today? I think we should be, be looking beyond tomorrow. Uh, it is such a fast moving area in which we live that uh, I think I'm going to take you on a very fast uh, track into the future. So I think uh, I will start, I will share my, uh, my screen. Um, and also I think uh, uh, this is being recorded. And I would also like to make the comment that if you really have a burning issue, not only can you put it into the chat and ask questions after I finish speaking, but if you really want to contact me, I'm sure as information professionals, you will be able to find me somewhere in the world. So uh, let me get started on talking about the beyond. So let me just share my screen, please. Um, am I able to do this, uh, Paul? I've got having a problem here of sharing my screen. Just a moment. Here we go. I've got it. All right. So um, the first thought that I have is we work in this area of memory institutions. Uh, the GLAM institutions. And I purposely said memory institutions because our organizations such as libraries and archives and all of the other GLAM, the galleries, the archives, the museums, and of course the records department, they are all collecting and safekeeping our memories. And not only are they safekeeping our memories, uh, they are sharing our memories with our communities. And that community can be the world. So I decided that this is how I was going to start. Let's talk about these memory institutions. They are both a place, as in a logical place, bricks and mortar, or wood and tin, and also a concept. So I really want to speak more about the memory institution as a concept. And in sharing this with you, uh, I will take you on this, ver this very, very fast um, vision that I have as to how we can uh, provide professionals, information professionals of all kinds to share our memories. So let me, um, let me talk about memory institutions a little bit here. Um, memory institutions, as we know, transmit experience and creativity across borders of time and space of language and custom, of tribe and individuality. This is the concept, this transmission of these experiences and how we create things. And therefore, if I talk about that, we can see that our institutions are 
not only libraries, but they are also our museums, um, our different tribes, our different contexts, all of those are part and parcel of this. They collect our recorded memories. And of course, they preserve our recorded memories and our heritage. And from that point of view, I think the information professionals are indeed covering all of those areas, the glam areas. I think possibly we need to think about LIS, which stands for Library and Information Sciences. Uh, I actually have a problem with that term, LIS, because it is really a meta discipline. It covers so many things. Yes, it covers library science. And by the way, libraries were not the first collecting institutions. If we go back several thousands of years, they were records departments. And those records were not memories, records of memories, but records of business, of transactions, of tax, uh, tax um, uh, documents. So library science came later, right? Then we have archival science. We also have information science. And information science is really about the science of information. And therein is another understanding that I have, which I will explore. Information is at one level, knowledge. And knowledge is really very contextual. And so we can include into this meta-discipline knowledge management, museum studies. These are also information. Museums are information. And so I'm going to put them all in together as Marcia Bates and most of you who have uh, read at least some things in the area of libraries and information studies would uh, recognize Marcia Bates, but in 2012, she said, the, these particular disciplines, these sciences manage the record for our culture, for all its users, from entertainment and education to pres preservation for future generations. So from going from today or yesterday or tomorrow to beyond, Let's look at some of these understandings. And please, at any time, um, probably Paul doesn't want me to, to answer questions immediately, <laughs> but put them into the chat. And uh, Paul will possibly at the end, um, because I have four lenses in my glasses and I can't read the chat very well. Um, Paul will probably interrupt me towards the end and ask burning questions. Would that be all right, Paul? Yes, we have a QA and a portion uh, after the talk. OK, terrific. Now, we live in a digital world. Our society is almost predominantly digital. I'm here in the Philippines where everybody seems to get everything from their smartphone. I don't, I haven't seen anybody read a newspaper. I haven't seen anybody not standing with a smartphone in their hands. So presumably, this is where you are all getting most of your information, but not entirely. I imagine that many of you go back to your families and get some information or some memories from your grandparents, perhaps. You might even go to a library to get information. So, I am looking at this understanding of convergence, convergence and collaborating. No longer do we just have a library. Mainly we have, driven by the digital uh, revolution, these five pillars of information, libraries, archives, records, museums, and galleries. And no one area has a franchise on our memories or on our information, or for that matter, on our data. So we have to collaborate 
among ourselves, share our expertise. And I am suggesting that we treat LIS as that glam with the R on the end of it, that glam sector, that metadiscipline. And so I'm going to hope to bring you along with me on this when we begin to think about what are the curricula that we need to develop and what we should have developed possibly last year, if not last century, in order to deal with all of this. So I thought about how I would speak uh, to you here in the Philippines, and I thought, all right, you've got a prescriptive uh, memorandum of how the curriculum is to be designed. So I read through this very, very carefully. Remember it said LIS. This is the CHED Memorandum number 24, 2015. And I pulled this out because I thought it was important. A GLAM education, according to the CHED Memorandum, says it is to systematically organize, conserve, preserve, and restore information objects and it actually says for example realia and museum pieces well that includes conservation conservation in museums that's very very broad that is not seem to be even mentioned in our general slightly archaic in my words slightly archaic understanding of lis education that we conserve paintings, which are our memories, which we conserve um, uh, manuscripts, which may be in museums, but also are in our archives. And indeed, uh, libraries often have uh, uh, very precious books in their libraries, which have to be conserved, not just catalogued. So I think the CHED Memorandum is actually very, very broad. So realia and museum pieces, historical and cultural documents, and it says artifacts and archival documents, indigenous knowledge. Let's think about that idea of indigenous knowledge. Certainly, at times it is written down, but doesn't that include oral histories? Do we need to be uh, understanding how to collect and to catalog oral histories in our LIS education? And of course, it continues on our CHED memorandum uh, that it is also to organize other intellectual properties, creative ideas and works by individuals and groups. What do we mean by creative ideas? Films, clearly. Uh, I don't know, rap music? Does rap music need to be part of our memory institutions? I would say yes. In other words, if I were in charge of the world, I would say that information rules the world. And we who are information professionals are in charge of ruling the world in order to spread all of these memories to all people at all times. Now, at this point, I could probably just quit and take questions, but I thought that's possibly not what uh, uh, Dean, Mary Grace and Paul want me to do. And in fact, I think you would probably like to hear me talk a little bit more. So let's move on because uh, with the understanding that the CHED Memorandum in 2015 says that LIS includes all of those institutions, all of those memory institutions. And so our education should be covering all of those. Yes, the things that you possibly hadn't thought about such as art galleries and such as oral histories and such as museums. I'm going to try to be controversial here just to uh, make everybody think a little bit. Now, I wanted to introduce you to a 
particular curriculum, only to show you what I mean by how we need to collaborate and, con and how our disciplines are converging. And Simmons College in the United States has actually designed a degree, this is a postgraduate degree, uh, called Cultural Heritage Informatics. Informatics means, of course, the, uh, the nexus of information and computing technologies and cultural heritage. Is this not glam? All of them. And in fact, a couple of the questions that uh, uh, you put up before I even started to speak was you needed more ICT information, right? Some more classes in that. So let's have a look at just very briefly what a new degree on cultural heritage informatics would look like. Yes, certainly the core curriculum states the things that we all have. Uh, reference and information services, whether that's in a library, whether that's in a museum, whether that is in an, uh, an archives or within a records department of a government, inf government department. We all have to learn information organization, whatever that might mean, how, but how we organize information in any of those sectors. And finally, technology for information professionals or an alternative course. And I'm not going to speak about Simmons' ideas about alternative course, but it is technology. We cannot live without technology these days. This morning in my hotel, uh, the internet went down for two hours and I almost went mad. I, I was bereft. I couldn't do anything. Well, I could, I could make myself a cup of tea, but I didn't need a computer to make a cup of tea yet, right? So those are the three core in any of our LIS uh, degrees in records, in, um, in archives, in libraries, in museums. But then we have four core requirements in this degree of cultural heritage informatics. We have concepts of cultural heritage informatics. Now that's slightly different. So we're talking about cultural context, we're talking about our tribes, we're talking about how our memory institutions are conserving our cultural heritage. And our cultural heritage is from many, many areas. The second core requirement is introduction to archive methods and services. Well, yes, we know about that because we've always had that in our archival programs, but it's slightly different from our cultural heritage information, okay? How our cultural heritage is being developed through technologies, the ICTs. And how about this one? Digital stewardship or preservation management. I believe they are two different things. One is curating or looking after our digital assets, not the analog ones, not the books, not the paper records, but our born digital information. And more and more we are having born digital information in museums, archives, libraries, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Preservation management, ah, it's one thing to have it in uh, all of these digital records, but we have to learn to preserve those digital records. And I've just uh, spent two days giving a workshop on preservation and uh, uh, preservation. And uh, that is uh, fairly complex. Digitizing it is one thing, but that's not preserving it. So we have to add into the mix this understanding of preservation management as well. And finally, it says digital asset management in libraries, archives, and museums. So what is digital asset management? Well, Paul mentioned in his opening remarks that he was a student in 
getting a master's degree in digital asset management. Not the analog stuff, but the digital assets of organizations. So those are three, four requirements in a cultural heritage informatics degree. Again, I bring us back to all of our memory institutions. There are also some quite, quite remarkable uh, electives. And I will come back to that towards the end of my talk if I have run out of time by then. And as I'm looking at my time, I better hurry along here. So if I could pose the idea that across all of the GLAM, and let's put an R on the end of that, uh, these GLAM and memory institutions, we have the same curriculum. It's converged. In all of those areas, we class information. We describe information. We manage our collections, no matter what those collections are. We curate our data. Oh, we'll come back to that in a moment as to what I mean by curating our data, but it is done in all of these organizations. We digitize our information for access and for preservation over time. All the curricula in records and et cetera, et cetera, deal with ethics and copyright and privacy issues. All of our memory institutions have to deal with financial management. It doesn't mean that every information professional has to deal with the financial management, uh, but all of those institutions have to have at least somebody there who can deal with the management of the finances. We all deal with information technology, every single one of us. Some just with being able to do a fairly uh, brilliant search using Google, others using technology to be able to um, use programming to integrate several different uh, software packages. So it come, goes from the very simple and to the more uh, complex. Again, we all have to deal with marketing and marketing uh, and promotion. Libraries have to market and promotion and promote their their goods, so to speak. So do museums. Hopefully our archives also promote and market their collections. Uh, there is also metadata application. And I know Paul has heard this particular little story I'm going to tell, but I'm going to tell it anyway, because I think it's important. I think it's important. And after all, I'm giving this talk. <laughs> Several years ago, I had a student, a master's student who came back for the second uh, semester and he was in a class where there were some new students. And so I said to him, so John, that was not his name, but that will do. So John, what rules the world? And he said, Maureen Henninger rules the world. I said, well, yes, of course that is true. However, what actually rules the world? And he said, metadata. And yes, metadata is the most, in my opinion, the most important thing we have, because unless you have metadata, you cannot describe, find, look for, organize, or any of those other things, our information and our data. So we all have to deal with that. We all have to deal with projects and project management. And finally, this converged curricula across all of these institutions deal with research skills. And I was thrilled to see people in the opening adding some of the things that they wanted into the LIS metadata, uh, LIS uh, broad curriculum, more research skills. So I think this is very important. I was really thrilled about that because without our information professionals doing research in all areas, we get stale. We don't know what's coming down uh, the turnpike, so to speak. 
of our digital revolution. So if we can say that all of those things are within a memory institution's curriculum, then why do we not just have one degree, here comes the controversy, one degree at different levels, undergraduate, postgraduate, and the doctorate level, why do we not have just one degree so that we can pick and choose those various contextual parts to deal with specific memory institutions? So that is the controversy. Now I'd like you to think about that. So our digital revolution, as I've said, it's all about convergence. All of these uh, professions are converging, being driven by technology. In particular, allowing us to access our collections, whatever they are, unbounded by space and time. So it's all very well for you to um, digitize some of your collections, like take wonderful photographs of some of your uh, manuscripts or <clears throat> photographs of some of your uh, sculptures, of digitizing some of your paper records. That's allowing it to be accessed by the organization, but more and more, the people of the world, and not just the world, perhaps in your own community, want to be able to look at that, not between 9.30 and 10.30 on a Saturday morning, when it's the only time that you have the budget to open your organization, but 24-7. That is extremely important. So we have the convergence and we have collaboration and they go together and the more we collaborate with uh, our various different information professionals the richer our collections are going to be the more expertise we will gather etc in order to deal with this digital revolution so collaborate in projects collaborate in expertise if you are in a library and you have been donated a set, for example, of fragile books. Do you know how to do that? Mm, probably not. Don't worry about it. Go over and talk to somebody in a museum or in an archives and say, help me. Can you teach me how to do this? Or better still, can we collaborate on this? And then can we write a research paper together? Right? This is the way we do things or should be doing things. We uh, collaborate on cross-institutional resources so that we can put on an exhibition, a digital exhibition, which includes cultural heritage, some of our, our records, some of our uh, paintings, and some of our literature, our precious books. Cross-institutional resources and make them available. And how do we make those available? Through metadata and metadata crosswalks. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because metadata is all the same, just with slight differences every now and again. And one of the things that you do need to uh, be taught about, if you don't already know, is the new language of the digital revolution. And that is XML. Right? So that is part of the basic information in technologies and database management. So I've got a few more minutes, I think. Yes? Uh, you, you still have a uh, lot more time. Go ahead. Lots of time. Oh, good. I love having, I love having the forum. Okay. So I went back then to the chaired memorandum but a different one this time, the one that was just updated uh, last year, number 22. And when I read it, it's short, but I noted that in 2021, it was recognizing the new trends. Well, I don't think they're the new trends. I think they're old trends, certainly for uh, the uh, second decade of the 20, uh, 21st century. 
One is the importance of preservation, of making sure that our materials, our heritage materials are available over time. And I quote from the Chaired Memorandum number 22, including microfilming and digitization of special archival collections. And I pulled that out because we probably or possibly all have to deal with microfilming. But as I uh, will tell you, some of our vital records in government departments, while they are born digital or they have been digitized in order to keep them safe for the next 100 years, they are then outputting them back on microfilm. So don't throw away your microfilm machines. They will be handy. The second thing that I pulled out of the Chaired Memorandum number 22 was the recognition of metadata interoperability through convergence of collections. And there it specifically says, you need to be able to use not just Mark 21, yes, that's for you librarians, but international metadata standards such as Dublin Core and many other ones as well. So I will come back to this understanding that metadata is metadata, they're just slightly different, that's all. And we need to be able to do all of this. So for let me give you an example. I mentioned a little bit about metadata crosswalks. So if you are in a museum or, or a gallery, an international standard would be this CDWA, this one right here, which is dealing with uh, muse uh, paintings, for example. And libraries have MARC, as we know. Um, records departments use EAD, or uh, there are a couple of other ones as well. And then there is a generic one, Dublin Core. Now, that Ched Memorandum mentioned MARC and Dublin Core, but they are all interchangeable. People have worked, people have collaborated among all of our memory institutions to say, if you sit deal with, if you're a library, you can use one particular, for example, for genre in Mark 566, but in Dublin Core, you simply, 566 genre is the same in Dublin Core, this type, okay? So you can interchange your metadata across many of the memory institutions. It's not difficult. I had undergraduates doing this within the first three uh, weeks of an undergraduate degree in digital assets management. So how do we put all of this into practice? Now, I gave a great deal of thought to this. No matter in which memory institution you are in, you are serving your community, whatever that community is. It could be a business community. It could be a municipality. It could be yeah, a barangay or a city or a province or a congressional district, et cetera, et cetera. And in each case, you have local information. Yes, you might have international information, but you have local information. So I decided to think about a very small municipality or a very small uh, a barangay up in, I don't know, in the top of Luzon, okay? I can't tell you one of them, but I've just pulled this one out. So you have local information. Let's say you only have uh, 2,000 people in the area, in your community. You might have not just the information that you want to help them to educate them for or for entertainment or the latest CD or the latest video of a rap a rapper or whatever it might be, but you might have realia that belongs to that local community. You might have historical photographs that belongs to that particular community. Why would you not be bringing those into your memory institution, uh, digitizing them 
to get out that information to the rest of the world. Oral histories, community newspapers, all of these are part of the local information in your community. So you are serving a range of different things, right? Local government units, uh, for example, civil registers. And I know that civil registers are a little bit difficult to find in, in the Philippines, at least on my five minute um, exploration trying to find some, but uh, perhaps you're, and I don't know this, but perhaps as in Australia, public libraries, uh, their governance is within the local government unit. And so why don't you perhaps, if that is the case, uh, go to the government department and say, we can look after your records. We can look after your civil registers. This is a possibility, not necessarily in the Philippines, but this is what is happening in other areas in our uh, LIS communities. And finally, uh, when you are serving your local communities, you are recognizing the diversity of the cultures and your indigenous groups. You are not only providing services for them, but being a collecting institution for those indigenous groups, for those cultures, and if possible, opening them up for the world to recognize the richness of your communities. It is so important in this global world we live in, the more we can understand what is happening across the world, the better off I truly believe we're going to be. So what are the benefits of having a joint curriculum or a somewhat joint curriculum? Well, you can share the technical services. Not everybody has to learn to uh, write code in Python or R. Okay. You can share those. You can have cross-domain learning. I would think that some of the benefits would be more impact on legislative and decision-making processes, particularly finances. I did note about two weeks ago that the, the federal government here, the 2023 had some severe budget cuts for the National Library, down 22%. For the National Archives, down 25%. The National Historical Commission was down, was reduced by 27%. And what absolutely horrified me was the National Commission for Culture and the Arts lost its funding by 84%. If that isn't an incentive to start collaborating with all of your different memory institutions, I can't think what might incentivize you more. It's really often about finances. Some of the other benefits of working collaboratively in this converged digital environment would be for professional development. Yes, the museum people can teach you how to digitize uh, your museum collection that you've got from part of your community. All of these things can be, um, I think, shared through professional development. And of course, finally, I think once you work with one another, you get higher visibility across all of these GLAM institutions. And remember, promotion and marketing is very, very important. If you try, if um, you cannot market your library, governments might say, well, nobody's going to the library, therefore, why are we spending money on the library? Why don't we just close it down? Think about that. And that does happen. Of course, it's not going to happen in the Philippines. I hope. So to return to the digital revolution, a, a that's supposed to be revolution, not resolution. My mistake here. We have recognized that it is a logical step to, digi to digitization and preservation that has been uh, known for quite some time. 
There is also this understanding of digital curation, the active management, active management of digital assets across the whole life cycle, from the point of creation through steps taken to facilitate access and long-term preservation. We also understand that we have to be literate in a digital society, this understanding of digital literacy, which has to be part of any LIS curriculum. So computer literacy, yes. Algorithmic literacy, what do we mean? Well, it's very simple. Who, where did all of our people find their information? Yeah, they go to Dr. Google, right? But do they understand the algorithms that drive Google? Do they understand the algorithms that uh, drive the information that people get from social media? If they do not, they are likely to fall into the problems of misinformation and disinformation. They need to be able to think critically. So they have to understand, they have to be taught how these algorithms work. It is extremely important. Certainly we need to be media literate to be able to understand various types of media. I don't mean just social media, but image media, uh, because more and more our uh, young people are driven by images rather than words. So we have to deal with media literacy and that deals is also including um, our news, the way we find our news. And of course, we all know that there are specialized literacies. Most LIS uh, areas have uh, medical literacy. They have specializations on medical um, information or I would prefer to say medical informatics because I think if you get specialized in a medical library, you need to know not only the medical terminology, but you need to be able to deal with things such as MRIs and X-rays and the various uh, technologies, you at least need to know something about them. So the specialized literacies of medical, Informatics, legal informatics, agricultural informatics, you can, et cetera, et cetera. So we already have all of these, I know. But what is beyond yesterday? And this is, I think, where I'm going to uh, really push you a little bit. The missing literacy from LIS education is data literacy. Think about this. Data information literacy is defined as the skills needed to understand, use, manage, share, work with, and produce data. I am talking about the zeros and ones, the bits in all of our digital information. And some of you may know David uh, Borden, who is very prominent in the LIS field, in 2017, he said, he and his student, uh, Ms. Robinson, said, all library and information professionals in all sectors will need to gain at least a basic appreciation of the issues around data, both technical and so socio ethical. Okay, so we all know that everybody wants ICT skills and those core skills are in our current curriculum. But what do we need? We need more. And this is about my last slide, although I do have some references in the back for those of you who wish to follow it up when you want to teach. What I am saying is the beyond yesterday the curricula, the new curricula that you need to be working on. So information professionals are involved in, they absolutely are involved in data support, research data management, data curation, data governance, data quality evaluation, data citation, 
and data literacy training. They may not know how to do all of that, but within their organization, they're involved in it. If you are in an academic library, for example, you may have your faculty people coming and saying, we need you to store our research data. How do you store research data if you don't know what it is? So you need to be able to apply metadata to it so you can find it, so you know if we have access to it or if it has been embargoed until your, sci your scientist has produced a patent. Right? You also, all information professionals need to understand the requirements of and the ethical considerations implicit in data scraping and wrangling, grabbing data off the web and using it for a particular project. What are the ethical considerations implicit here? And maybe also to be able to uh, teach your constituents how to do this and what is possible and what is permissible around copyright for example. I also decided to add in this understanding of the implications of artificial intelligence. Oh my, what does that mean? We use it all the time in our, in our institutions now. We have automatic indexing. Okay, Look at all the databases we use. Nobody sits there anymore and actually adds metadata to it. It's automatically done. Our documents are often classified automatically by the, this artificial intelligence, these robots, if you will. And I don't know about you, but many, many times when I go to an institution and I need some help, it says, why didn't you have a little chat with our help? And that little chat with the help is not the person, it is a chatbot who is using artificial intelligence to understand what it is you want and to guide you, right? Very important for our information professionals to understand that, to learn that. And finally, I think data analytics are so important. Even if you're not doing research in data, you need to be able to improve your institutional services by being able to analyze the data that is coming into your organization to know that you need to have three more people to work on a particular area. So information professionals need to be doing data science of one kind or another, to be having in their curriculum this whole area of data literacy. Um, so this was taken from a particular um, ACES, that's the uh, uh, American Association for Information Science Survey, not too long ago, um, in, well, actually two months ago to be precise. And these are the things that are in LIS curricula in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, and, it, that, and that would include Australia as well. Machine learning, statistics, data mining, data visualization, big data, data science, database management. I had to look up what they meant by database management. Yeah, and it means that you can use interoperability to get one database into another one using XML. That was what uh, they meant by that. Deep learning, natural language processing, data analytics, artificial intelligence, information visualization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are the new skills, the new competencies that are so important across the GLAM institutions in the future, which was yesterday. So thank you very much, and I will open it up to questions, or Paul will open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Maureen, for uh, that wonderful presentation. Uh, to our participants, please uh, feel free to send in your comments and questions 
Uh, you can send your questions by going to slido.com or you can also click the link that's pasted here in our chat section. Paste the link here. Or you can also uh, raise your hand uh, so that we can acknowledge you. Uh, you can click on the raise hand icon. And then if you want to uh, ask your questions live, you can do that as well. So. Everybody's gone silent. I think they're letting it uh, sink for a moment, uh, Maureen. But I think uh, uh, someone has a question. Uh, I'm seeing here uh, Dr. Maria Mercedes uh, is opening her camera. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Just close the camera. <laughs> sorry, I thought she was, uh, she was going to a question but yes please let me know if you have any questions you can send it in the slido or you can put it in the chat section or you can also raise your hand if you have if you want to ask your questions like yes um, um i think yes I, um okay go ahead i have something to say you have dropped the bomb oh, maureen <laughs> Oh, good. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> yes, um, because we've been operating on the fact that um, we, we have legislation for the LIS uh, program, especially in the undergraduate, which is the entry okay. level for the okay. profession. Okay. And um, while it is true that uh, there's no stopping the schools to adopt the the principle of you know having one course and uh, giving the menu uh, for either you know an archives course um, uh, a museum um, mm -hmm. a program uh, we can definitely do that but it's one way for us to either revise the law or work around it. Okay. I don't think my reading of the chaired agreements that the chaired memorandums, you're not changing the law. It's in there. It says you can do all of those things. Mm -mm. All right. And it would be my contention that there are core things, core requirements in the chaired memorandum for all of those. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, I don't know, if you were doing records, why don't you have the assignments for records? Yes. Which are different from assignments for museums or, or, mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. So they're learning what they the need core. to know and then being able to apply it mm -hmm. by um, an assignment mm -hmm. or a project. Yes. Also, recognizing the fact that we don't have undergraduate preparations for the archives. Uh, we don't have undergraduate preparations for a museum. Only uh, in limited um, universities that offer uh, art studies, but not even, you know, um, museum administration. They, they, they only have three to six units of electives in museum curation, administration, I don't know. But uh, I just <laughs> had the thought that if we can have this as, if the law that requires uh, librarians to go through um, the examinations, if we can work around um, the whole program, but still address the fact that only BLIS graduates can take uh, the board examinations and, you know, allow uh, for the other professions and the GLAM uh, professions to go through the programs that we have. I would, I, I, I'm still suggesting it is the same program mm -hmm. that has, that is then can be contextualized mm -mm. for mm. those different, e e even at the undergraduate level. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. And now I'm going to say something that is highly controversial now, but um, how many uh, libraries, under people going to work in an undergraduate library or, or in a public library, actually catalog 
actually catalogues a book. In a special library, yes. They have to understand what cataloging is, but they do they actually catalogue a book? They don't in public libraries in Australia. Maybe they do here. But the, the point is they have to learn what it is. They have to understand the concepts. They would have uh, exercises or assignments in doing it, but I don't know that they need to spend, and I don't know how long they have to spend in it. Yeah, a whole semester doing it. Is that, now that is probably highly controversial, but that's all right. I said I was going to be controversial. Nobody wants to quarrel with me, go ahead. <laughs> let's, let's have an argument or a discussion. Yes. Um, well, we would like to hear uh, from our fellow faculty members here, um, or at least speak um, as an alumni of uh, LIS schools. How is it with you now? What would you like um, to be changed in the present curriculum? Yeah, that's a very good question, um, Mom Kate. So if, uh, I know a lot of the participants here are, are LAS educators, but many also uh, joined in as graduates of an LAS program. So now that you are information professionals, you know, what do you wish you learned when you were uh, in your LAS, when you're taking up LAS uh, that you're currently using in your in your work? I ito si, uh, Dr. Russell Dolendo. Uh, Ma'am Dolendo, hello po. Um, let me... Ayan, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, good there afternoon. Go. Good afternoon, so, uh, good afternoon, Sir Paul. Good afternoon to everyone. No, May I just answer? Um... The possibility you know, of enhancing the curriculum, most particularly that would align that uh, would align to the curriculum that is needed by um, institutions, and I'm not talking or organizations, and I'm not talking only of the national organization institutions that we have, but also we see beyond, no, especially that our graduates are already employed in in uh, foreign lands, no. So parang sa amin, marami kaming librarians na na ha hire, for example, sa, sa Thailand, uh, even as far as uh, Canada, and they are actually um, feeding us back that. Uh, we try to enhance the curriculum, particularly adding more um, specialization. Slowly, we can do it. I know that uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of uh, the existing no um, policies and memorandums that we have, it doesn't say it's so. But uh, kailan tayo magsistart kung hindi galing din sa atin? Siguro we identify the most feasible curriculum that we could add. We can include it. Um, in our or integrate it first in the curriculum that we already have and maybe introduce one special um, uh, subject. Kung yung iba nakakapag-introduce ng uh, DRRMC plus uh, oh, what's this? Um, um, more on uh, ano yung nauna last time no? on uh, a special education Baka pwede natin ding lagyan ng isang uh, elective or, or, or mandatory subjects. Subject, I don't know if it's mandatory, sorry for the term. Uh, but anyway, baka pwede lagyan ng about information science also. Sorry, nagtatagalog ako. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, that's that's perfectly fine, um, um, Russell. I, I think uh, Maureen got the, uh, got the message that yeah. uh, we and can... Yeah, go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, no, I just would like to say thank you to our speaker. Sorry, I forgot to mention that a while ago. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Yes, that's I, a very good uh, uh, comment, Ma'am Russell. Thank you so much for bringing that up. So, Maureen, uh, they already are reaching out to their graduates who are already working in, as you heard, in Thailand and Canada, and they're experimenting, adding slowly uh, some subjects like uh, she mentioned DRRM, which is disaster risk 
and reduction mm -hmm. management. Uh, they've also had, uh, what was that earlier? Uh, but they are trying these different electives to be included in the program. And I think you also mentioned uh, something about specialization. So uh, I guess the question is like, uh, what would be the le like uh, an ideal component of core and specialization subjects for for an LIS curriculum? Morning. <laughs> Uh, which level are we looking at? Undergraduate, uh, most, postgraduate? Uh, we'll start with the undergraduate first because that is, uh, I would say, the common denominator for most of the institutions here in the Philippines. A lot are offering undergraduate programs. Um, all right. I think uh, an understanding of what information is. That's the first one. What is information? Now, what would that include? It would include all the ways that information is given to us, documents, manuscripts, uh, books, data, all of those things. So it's concepts in information, very broadly. These young people, they're smart. If, if you said, you know, our libraries are full of books, they're going to say, well, what, what about CDs? And what, what about... Uh, the new vinyls that are coming back instead of, you know, the, the Spotify or whatever it might be. They're going to, they are smart. They know what information is. And they might be saying, well, why aren't you including how we catalog some of these things, catalog some of these things so we can find them. So concepts in information, I think, is the very first one. And that would include data, right? That would be the first one. A uh, second one would be, how it is organized, concepts in, or perhaps a better one would be how concepts in management of information. That is metadata, classification, and I don't mean in the old understandings, but broadly, concepts in, yeah, in management. We manage it in digital ways as well as in analog ways, we manage it from the, its creation through to its uh, ultimate preservation. So that is part of that particular subject, which looks at um, the life cycle of things. I think all of that can be done in, I don't know how, 15 weeks? Yeah, of course it can be done in 15 weeks, right? And the, um, and the assignments, uh, taking those concepts and having, I, I don't know, do you have group assignments at the undergraduate level? Group assignments and getting somebody who is working in digital or museum or, or, or the concepts there and putting it together. That's another subject. So we've only got two so far. I can think of a whole lot more. Do you see where I'm going with this? You know, get, let the students learn by doing, not learn by having somebody tell them how to do it. I, I could go on, but um, perhaps uh, um, here at uh, the University of the Philippines, I might uh, design a brand new curriculum for them and they can share it with you all that still meet all of the requirements of the, uh, the CHED memorandum. Have I answered that question, sort of? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, there's uh, definitely the core are very important, but uh, designing the activities, the, the assignments, as you mentioned, that will enable the students to apply those score in different contexts would be very attractive as well for the LAS curriculum, for an LAS program. Um, I think one of the common uh, uh, struggles of the LAS uh, curriculum here in the Philippines would be, uh, as people have mentioned earlier, is the, is the legislation. So there needs to be uh, students who want to take the board exam, they have to have the degree title, library and information science. Uh, now, this is a question that I want to pose to you, Morton. 
uh, because names, of course, uh, especially the name of the degree is very important. What do you see would be the future of the Bachelor of Library and Information Science in terms of naming the degree? If you want to stick with the, the uh, I, I really have no problem with the course, the Bachelor of Library and Information Studies. Bec you, you could still use that because information studies includes all of these other informations. That's the point that I, I'm making. Now, to call it national heritage or anything, uh, those are very radical. But if the legislation assumes that it's going to be for quite some time, library and information uh, studies, um, perhaps uh, I might, if, it, if I were ruling the world, if I was the legislator, I might say Bachelor of Information Studies might include libraries, include archives, include museum informatics, right? Um, but if you can't change that, well, make sure that you put the L in little case and information studies in double size font. I'm slightly joking here, but you know, if you can't change the legislation, use the same title if that is what you have to do, but make sure that your subjects cover everything that the legislation has, says that you can have in it. There's no reason in the world why you cannot have a, a special subject on museum informatics. It says in that shared memorandum, realia, no? it says it. So why can't you have one special subject, an elective on museum informatics? Why can't you do that? You can, it's there in the memorandum. And that's the point that I want you to, what I am passionate about is to, for you to broaden and work with what you've got. And as it says you can do that, then do it and do it quickly. Thank you so much, Marie. Now, you mentioned working on what we got. And uh, earlier in your presentation, there's also a focus on data literacy. And this touches on other concepts like uh, knowledge of algorithmic literacy, uh, being able to understand uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, I want to pose these questions to our participants because it's also very rare to have uh, the representatives from other uh, their schools gathered together here. So let's uh, take this opportunity to hear from you. Now, uh, definitely we want our curriculum to be, uh, to be responding to the times and being able to teach uh, algorithmic literacy, what would be, what do you see would be the challenges for your institutions if you want to like adapt uh, the kind of curriculum that Maureen also envisions for us? Uh, anyone who would like to share? I'll share if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, Yes, uh, in Australia, Maureen, uh, are, are, would you know if there are already uh, AI classes being taught in the, but this is, of course, master's programs, right? Yeah, well, actually, they're, they're teaching these things in schools. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in regular primary schools, they are teaching uh, data hygiene, what, what they call data hygiene, you know, data mm -hmm. clean, for example. Yeah. So if they're teaching that in sixth grade, why are we not being able to teach that in, um, in a degree that is dealing with information and data is information? Okay, so, so that's, I, I'm just take the words and just put a slightly different slant on it and you can get away with it, I think. Well, I've, I've spent, you know, a whole career in getting away with things. <laughs> but uh, from the point of view of um, uh, data, uh, well, you, you said algorithm, you said AI and algorithmic um, illiteracy. <laughs> Part of the most basic, simple 
LIS curriculum includes how to find information. Is that correct? Information discovery? Yes? Then just add to information discovery, not just, you know, putting keywords into a search engine or looking up a card catalog or whatever it, it is. Teach them that if you're going to get it from, uh, for example, from social media or, or from uh, Google, and everybody knows that everybody gets everything from Google, right? Teach them the algorithms that can skew the you can do it in one lecture. Huh? It is just another lecture of a different thing of critical thinking when you are looking for information. Just make them aware that the big tech have agendas. Simple as that. Yeah, and give them some examples and get the group of students, you know, in half an hour to each sit and find something and see using Google and seeing how the different information comes out. They all get different things depending on what they've been doing five minutes ahead of time when they're supposed to be listening to the lecture, right? So, that, that, I mean, algorithmic literacy can be taught fairly quickly. That, that's what I'm saying as part of the subject, uh, research, uh, you know, um, uh, information discovery. Has that answered your question? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, for... sort of, anyway. <laughs> um, uh, the submission for questions is still open, so if anyone has any question, please feel free to do so. Again, you can also uh, raise your questions here in the comment section. Feel free to speak up. Your, uh, you, you can uh, unmute your microphones. So while uh, you are still thinking about your questions, uh, let's hear, because uh, I, I can see that some people here have their cameras on, so tatawagan ko muna si Ma'am Kate. <laughs> Ayan, so Ma'am Kate, uh, I know... Yes, PJ. <laughs> 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 e, ayon. Anyway, I think I'm assuming the co-host. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tito Magalion, you have your camera on. Do you have any question or comment? Mom Tess, how are you? How's the discussion so far? I find it uh, interesting. Uh, I agree uh, with Dr. Uh, Henninger. Uh, in uh, the CMO that uh, was released uh, 2015, which is uh, being uh, implemented uh, nationwide in all uh, library schools, uh, it is stated that the school may, uh, shall we say, uh, design and enrich uh, the curriculum. So it is really very timely since uh, <clears throat> the new standard uh, applicable to HEIs uh, really makes use of technology. And uh, I am really so happy that there were some suggestions that may really be implemented. Remember, in a, shall we say, in the undergraduate program, there is what we call the outcomes-based education. So all the suggestions of uh, Dr. Maureen will, can really be applied in our setting. So thank you very much. I, I had noted uh, so many details and uh, I think uh, I will uh, include that in my uh, lessons. Thank you very much. 
You're most welcome. I am so glad I've got a convert immediately. <laughs> <laughs> dare I say, look, the whole point of it is for, for we as information professionals need to dare to move forward. Dare to dream, dare to move forward. Take the words in the legislation and push it to the utmost limit. I think is what I would like to say. Thank you. Yes. Thank um, you. Uh, sorry, I got disconnected <laughs> earlier. Yes. Now uh, someone is raising uh, their hands. The doctor has. Uh, doctor yes. has. Go ahead. Okay. May I check my uh, audio? Is it uh, okay? Yep. Uh, sorry, sorry, you're on mute. The mute ka ulit, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, the Ayan, problem okay is the uh, internet to uh, connectivity. But definitely, I'm so happy to hear from uh, our uh, resources speaker. Uh, she presented, which is we are uh, we are in need actually. But I have uh, followed also another CMO of uh, the commission, which is uh, pertaining to the graduate school, which is uh, a CMO number uh, if, uh, the graduate school. Uh, series of 2019, uh, there is this uh, portion that we have to uh, present creative works. No? And I'm also thinking, what is that creative work that we have to, uh, I mean, uh, mandate or uh, we, we have to teach also with our students, aside from what uh, uh, Dr. Hernandez had mentioned for the undergrad that, that should be outcome-based. But for the graduate level, we are requiring to present creative works. No? So that is one, uh, I mean, uh, one of the challenges that we have to consider in the design of our new curriculum. So for uh, the re response for that, I have validated you know, what my decision is uh, as program head of the, of the program. So, uh, I'm so I'm so happy to, uh, that we are able to, to see you know, what we have uh, suggested and what we have presented in the, in the curriculum was in the right track and it's an international international practice so with that i am also happy to to hear and uh, we learn no from the sharing of uh, our resources speaker but then uh, i am wondering also now that i think it's about time for us no uh, in the in the in the profession that we have to really run no, run <laughs> the speed run that we need now because some of the the program the courses have already do something for their curriculum and until uh, this time you still have following the cmo 2015 it's 22 and uh, we are saying that we are uh, you know information specialists that we have to integrate things like this but our cmo is still uh you know <laughs> far behind <laughs> to what is the situation is but I'm so happy. That's why I'm uh, interested to listen and uh, I'd like to check, verify if the design that I have presented is right, correct, and uh, really uh, relevant uh, at this present time. So that we're able to expect that our graduate, that our uh, professional uh, coming and uh, the coming generation is really, really ready for this, not in the 21st, but in the 30th. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Good luck to you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you so that, much. In that running that you're doing very fast. <laughs> yeah. Usually we have to prepare five to ten years. So uh, the, uh, in the in industry, they are, uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, industrial revolution, the 4R, uh, the 5R, like that. So I think uh, uh, since we are moving slowly but surely, but definitely we have to uh, I speed up our uh, running when it comes to the curriculum that we have because I think our graduates still really uh, have to uh, grasp, no? What is uh, the new trend in the in the in the environment, especially in the information industry? Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Haas. That's very exciting no? uh, uh, about your master's, no? your graduate program. Uh, I'm assuming uh, uh, you mentioned creative, so this must be an MA, a Master of Arts in IC. Yeah, 
uh, uh, Maureen, as she's referring to uh, a memorandum that was released by CHED that requires uh, a graduate program to have uh, either be defined as a Master of Arts or a Master of Science uh, yeah. in, in, in the program. So congratulations, Dr. Haas, for, for your uh, graduate degree, and we're looking forward to, uh, to the success of your program. Um, any more comments or suggestions uh, about, uh, uh, about the lecture of Dr. Henniger on looking beyond uh, our curriculum? I'm also checking if uh, there are people who submitted their questions here. Yep. Uh, but again, we appreciate those who who share their sentiments uh, uh, about the presentation. And then definitely the next thing that we need to do as Maureen has emphasized is to collaborate. Now, uh, Maureen, before we end our session, are, do you have any more, uh, uh, any parting words for our uh, participants? I would have many parting words, but uh, uh, I think probably the most important thing that I have to say is uh, dare to imagine. It is about imagination. Imagine what can be done. Talk to young people. Ask them what they think should be done. Ask them what they want. Many cases they might be hesitant and I know you are all so terribly polite in the Philippines. I'm afraid Australians, if I ask Australians what they want, they tell me very, very quickly, even before I ask them. But I think my parting word really would be dare, dare to be imaginative, dare to be a little bit pushy, and dare to push the boundaries of what you want to do and what you can do. All right. Maraming, <laughs> maraming salamat, Maureen. Thank you very much for uh, gracing our webinar for today. To all our participants, uh, we receive your registration, so you'll receive a copy of the recording as well as the slides prepared by Dr. Henninger. And to give an evaluation, please uh, go to the link that is posted in the chat section. Uh, it is bit.ly slash las-curriculum-ph. Uh, you can also click on the link so that we can hear your feedback if you have, or if you have more comments or suggestions about the webinar. Ayun lang po. So again, uh, maraming salamat to all our participants. Let's give our resource speaker a round of applause. Thank you very much, Maureen. And Maureen, uh, Dr. Maureen Henniger, again, is currently a visiting professor of the UPSLIS and is currently here in the Philippines, and she'll be here until uh, Friday of this week. So thank you again, Maureen, for joining us. And thank you everyone for joining this webinar. Have a great week ahead. Maraming salamat.